thank you for your um, kind words of introduction. I think I'm going to be tethered to this microphone. Um, as it was said, I'm, I'm program manager in, the, in JISC. JISC stands for the Joint Information Systems Committee. We're a UK-wide uh, body funded by the four higher education funding councils in the UK to essentially get the economies of scale and, and efficiency um, by helping um, the large number of higher, higher and further education institutions across the country make best use of IT. I think that's the kind of simplest um, description of it. Um, so the, the words there are, are just a sort of some, some basic sort of introductions to what we do. Um, so it's really about sharing best and emerging best um, practice um, in the use of ICT for education. Um, and through our work in the past, we've, we've made sort of some quite, we can, some things we can definitely put figures on and say, yes, these things have made a real difference. So just collections, which is our content arm. Um, so a lot of the things you will have seen recently, you've probably been aware of things, we work in partnership with the British Library, the BBC, people like that. So every so often you get this archive of papers or, or things like that has, has, has been made available online. That, that'll be through our work. And also in the access to um, journals and, and resources for institutions and brokering very good deals with the publishers. Um, we connect 18 million people across the UK uh, through the Janet network and uh, Shan will be talking more about Janet uh, in his part of this talk. And, and we fund an awful lot of innovation projects. Um, sometimes we think too many because it's a bit hard keeping track of them all and, and bringing it all together. But, but you know, in, in all sorts of areas um, around the application of IT to education. And um, we have a number of advisory services, um, some of them reaching right down into the regions to local um, workforce, um, you know, work-based learning providers and people like that. And uh, assessments have been made which show that delivering saving, um, savings of £12, or efficiency gains of £12 per, per £1 invested. Um, so why are we interested in um, why JISC, why cloud? Um, I'm just going to talk a bit about the, 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 the role of cloud in education and, and um, its links with the sort of other side of, 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 of the cloud in the wider public sector. And also just talk a bit about some of the work we're actually doing, the studies, the programs and other things, and, and where we see this work is going next. So the, um, it's really about why we're interested. It, it's, well, I think one of the pr primary areas is it's about doing things, doing new ways of doing things. I mean, a lot of these technologies are really a convergence of, of things we already knew about, but it's the opportunity to take things forward. So efficiency, obviously, cost, um, although I talk about cost later because we're having trouble actually really understanding costs, um, and energy and the, the potential for helping the sector meet its um, uh, carbon targets, which have been quite, you know, set quite challenging as they probably are across all the sectors you deal with. Um, I think innovation, more effective processes is, is perhaps the most important part. The collaboration, um, the, the, uh, and I think perhaps one of the things that distinguishes higher education from a lot of the sectors that maybe people, other people in this room work with is, is it's by its very nature a very collaborative process. We have research teams working not just nationally but internationally spread across areas. Um, one of the things that people who come from other sectors into higher education, one of the things they're always amazed by is, is, the, the, is the amazing level of collaboration um, even between institutions that might be seen as, as, as competitors. I think the move from sort of the the, cap, the, the, the move from capex to opex um, is, is obviously of interest. Although I have to say, for many IT directors, capex is is um, something they can they're, they're much happier about sometimes than than, than opex. Um, but also the implications of of the move to the cloud, um, the skills procurement, 
how, how do we buy this stuff? What sort of skills do our people need? What are the legal ramifications of this? And like with local education authorities, um, we have a lot of sensitive data, researchers working on, on all sorts of things which shouldn't get into the public domain, uh, like climate data, you might say. Um, and also helping the sector to understand what's the reality of this? How do we move from, from hype to the reality and help them make good choices? I think it's worth just, this is a diagram from the Strategic Vision for EU Infrastructure by, by uh, Tildesley report for, for, done for Biz last year. And I think it, it makes a good model of where cloud kind of sits in the wider um, e-infrastructure landscape. And you can see there's a, lot of, there's a lot of other bits of e-infrastructure, which um, the higher education research community really lives on, uh, depends on. And I think one of the areas where we do have, have perhaps quite special needs are, are in HPC, and there's never enough of that. And the, the role possibly of cloud to, to help um, buttress and support that. But also a lot of the other skills around um, software development in, in e-science and stuff, which have a bearing on the move to the cloud. So what we have done and where we've got to, um, there's a lot of, a big take up of, of what you might term software as a service in, in universities. Um, Google and Microsoft have been giving um, email services free for students and um, you're also starting to see a take up of, of these cloud-based email services for, um, for, for staff as well. Um, distributed VLEs, uh, virtual learning environments in the cloud. Um, and also in, in research. We don't see cloud as re replacing HPC in the foreseeable future, um, but working with standards to ensure the seam seamless interoperability and, and, and ability to, to move in and out in, in the hybrid model, which we had talked about earlier. We did some work, and it's interesting to hear David talked earlier about enterprise architecture and the need to align the business processes and models with the, um, the understand those really before you can make best use of these things. So we did a lot of work about around looking at the flexible service delivery. And one of the, one of the things that's kind of very interesting about working in JISC and with the higher education sector is, is all universities are slightly different. They all have different needs. So, You've got six colleges, the Bloomsbury Group in London, specialist colleges. And so they now have a, 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 a private um, uh, repository, a media cloud uh, for their open educational resources. Um, a curriculum management in the cloud, flexible services for research, a hybrid cloud working with different vendors, uh, things like that. And we've also produced a legal toolkit, security, privacy, data protection, SLAs, the lot, from our um, advisory service, JISC Legal. Those are freely available, not just for higher education. I think you'll find stuff of, of relevance to, to all sectors there. So do go and, and have a look for those. Um, on costing the cloud, a study recently reported to us seems to suggest that, that on pure cost comparison, uh, cycles, but cycle to cycle, comparing apples with apples, if that's possible, cloud looks one and a half to two times more expensive. But my hunch, my belief with that is we're not actually counting the costs. And like David said, you know, he, he thought he was it 28 million or yeah, and then found it was sort of half as much again. I think there's a lot of other hidden costs within institutions particularly on IT delivery. Um, a lot is absorbed into ad hoc and um, research students, postdocs, people like that who tend the servers and, and, and do all that stuff, which we're not really counting. Um, we've got some projects running, as you can see, looking at um, biology across the things, science, um, astronomy, 
um, space debris, that's a nice one. Uh, flood modeling uh, could be useful in this weather. Um, and also one looking at access and identity management for the cloud. And I think this is a really important area um, for making best use of the cloud. I just want to give a quick nod to, I think, a very interesting development, um, something called eScience Central at uh, Paul Watson at Newcastle, at the University of Newcastle. This was quite an early adopter of, of, the cl of a cloud model for research, um, delivered through a browser, elements of social networking so the researchers can connect with other researchers. There's a security model which allows you only to share what you want to with your collaborators. Um, there's a workflow engine where you can sort of drag and drop, point and click, um, putting workflow together for your um, experiment. And then as needed, it'll go out to the cloud and, and, and pull in the resources it needs to do the computation. Maybe not suitable necessarily for sort of high-end, heavy-duty number crunching, but for prototyping, for um, quick route to market, a very interesting development. Um, Sean will talk about the um, UMF and the, um, the brokerage, um, but there are other bits of it, including um, uh, an enterprise service bus in the cloud um, to enable modularization and uh, people to pull in bits of that as they need, either to, to run it in the cloud or, or to run it locally or, or in a hybrid way. And um, the research management um, application, this is a, a common task to all the universities with the research base. They all have to do these things. So uh, we're running a, a shared enterprise service bus. This is a, an application of the, um, of, of the enterprise service bus. And you can see the way it works um, with two universities in this case. Um, sorry, I'm getting back. Um, two universities being able to, to uh, in this case, to use bits of it, and university, the third university, um, running more, some of the modules locally. So that's an interesting model um, of a kind of a particular application. Um, research data management, the avalanche of data within institutions uh, gets only bigger, big science, um, things like um, the square kilometer array experiment, the, the avalanche of data that's coming, um, hadron, large hadron collider, things like that. Um, so actually sort of understanding better, developing better tools for, for, for managing data. And the issues we see, um, skills, I think there's a real worry about, uh, universities are, are a kind of development ground for a lot of people who cut their teeth, develop skills in IT within universities. If we simply turn IT into a commodity, will we lose those skills and, and maybe not be able to get them back? Um, I think how to, how to engage with vendors, how to understand it, and I think the Cloud um, Industry Forum sounds like an interesting body maybe to, to talk some more with. Um, interoperability, one of the things that JISC is founded on is open standards, and so I think avoiding more vendor lock-in um, from, from, from going down particular cloud routes is quite important. We need to keep up with the changes in cloud capability and um, authentication and security, obviously, um, it, it is going to be really important for enabling the use of cloud. Costs, as I say, we still really need to get a handle on, on, on what IT is really costing the sector um, because we're not really able to make valid comparisons without that. And, um, oh, sorry, I'm rather thrown me not having a, um, a, a screen in front of me. Um, international collaboration, uh, we're working with partners in Europe and, 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 and worldwide um, on, on the application of cloud for um, research and higher education. So I'm going to hand over to Shan now and um, he can tell you about the brokerage. Thank you. Um, so my name's Shan. I'm here on behalf of Janet. Uh, so a quick slide on Janet. So uh, probably many of you have used it, even if you don't know. Um, we're the uh, National Research and Education Network. We connect universities, research establishments, 
uh, a number of local authorities, further education colleges. Basically, we, we're the network that powers uh, that connectivity. Um, and we, we've been fundamental in networking for some time. Um, and there's a 100 gig core, which there's a few things we're proud of, obviously. We're, we're very proud of our network. Um, it's a very high capacity network that we feel uh, delivers some great benefit for research and education. Um, research being a good example, if you think of the amount of data that comes out of places like CERN or the genomics projects or uh, a lot of science, really, the, the, um, the equipment is getting better. It means it captures a lot more data, and that means there's a lot more to transfer from, from site to site. So uh, the network's very important, um, and we have 18 million end users. Um, why is that important? Well, the network is obviously quite important for cloud. So if, you, um, if you're thinking about cloud, you're thinking about how you're going to connect to it. One of the big things that we've heard from a lot of our institutions is making sure they have resilient connectivity and all that kind of thing. So um, Janet is, is, is really, the foundation is around the network. Um, but the University's Modernization Fund came along, and that was around um, driving efficiency, uh, looking at how we can use cloud, basically. I think a few uh, bright sparks in uh, senior areas of government thought, this cloud thing's going to save us a lot of money. Um, how do we do that in higher education? So fundamentally, that's what it's about. Uh, what can we do with cloud? How can we drive um, the efficient use of it? And, and fundamentally, that's all about improving services and value, um, not just necessarily on a pure cost basis, but how do we improve uh, across the piece? Um, and how are we going to try and do that? We're going to try and work with um, suppliers, uh, remove the hurdles to adoption, look at the various aspects, a lot of which has been covered around all the risks, the technical, a lot of governance that's been talked about. And a lot of it is around, um, there's a certain amount of myth busting, that there's, um, uh, I think everyone thought George Bush was gonna steal their data, and I guess a few still do. Um, but understanding that cloud isn't just Amazon EC2 or uh, Google Gmail, it's a whole variety of things, um, and including the hybrid models as well. So there's a, an all, all sorts of ways of uh, getting to grips with cloud. And uh, it's about trying to look at who provides what and, and, and how. And, and advocating the good practice around that. So um, the, the thing I see with cloud is, cloud brings a lot of confusion, both in the terminology, but in terms of the absolute plethora of, uh, of products that are out there, and understanding who supplies what, um, under what governance, and looking at things like this. Um, I, was just, I was interested in the certification that was talked about. I think the idea of um, providing some sort of standards around cloud is a really good thing. How do we help to drive those standards so that they, they meet the requirements of our customers? So um, that's all really good stuff. And um, here's a slide that, we, this, was, this was a slide done around um, the universities, but I think it's familiar to, to most people, which was around the blockers to adoption. Um, accountability, lack of knowledge, union opposition, well, union and workforce opposition, um, buy-in, finance, all of these things, I think, are, are familiar to many, of, many people across the public sector, um, but they're, they're the sort of things that we looked at in terms of uh, higher education and further education. So the, I suppose the interesting thing is we, we're, a, we're a brokerage, um, and why, why, did they, why did we get formed? Well, because Gartner thought it was a great idea to do it. Um, um, so th there's a lot of talk around... Um, uh, cloud service brokers, both in uh, private and public sector. Um, so really, what, why did we come about? Um, we're sort of a bit like the cloud adoption model, actually. Three or four years ago, there was a project done called the Shed Project, which was actually about building a big shed and putting servers in it for higher education. That was the, that was the model that we were looking to use a few years ago. Um, by the time... Uh, things got to uh, the team being formed and us having a look at what we should do. Actually, the models moved on. There are so many vendors out there already. There are so many data centers and uh, providers in this cloud market. It seemed a bit foolish to, to just add another one to the mix. Um, and actually, what we thought was a bit more sensible um, was to act as a, as a broker in the middle, working on behalf of higher education, further education research. So, 
The idea behind this is to act as a, as a neutral party um, to, to govern the responses that we get from suppliers and the demand that we have from our, from our user base um, to help drive cloud adoption. And so I think that um, one of the things that's come about over the last eight or nine months of, of working on this is that there's a lot of benefits from both parties. So um, Rob talked a bit about higher education being a, a place of collaboration. And um, one of the things is, if although that every institution is unique, there is a lot of commonality. I think that probably applies um, across many of the public sector as well as um, the, the sector that we're in. Um, and actually, suppliers don't want to have those conversations uh, every time around the Patriot Act or uh, the governance, et cetera, et cetera. So what can we do to help lower that cost of sale for the suppliers and also then help to drive a lower cost for the products for, for our user base? So what can we do to take uh, a set of customers uh, to market together, help by aggregating their demand into something that gets them a good deal, but also um, means that suppliers are providing that uh, less times. So basically, we feel that we can add um, access, we can provide benefit both to suppliers and customers. Um, and one of the interesting things about that is, I think what we're hoping to see is, uh, and we're already seeing it, is suppliers coming from sectors outside of, um, of our own and saying, well, you know, we weren't so keen on working with individual institutions, but actually, if you're willing to act as a conduit and help us understand what your customers want and help us understand how we can put our products to market, then we're interested in actually moving our products from local government or central government and actually putting that somewhere else. So that's a really useful thing that we think we can enable more, more providers to come into the market. And by doing that, we can offer our customers more choice. Um, I think there's a, there's a subsidiary benefit, which is that maybe there's something like a core function, like a back office, where we might just build on someone else's infrastructure. So they might have already built it for you. Um, so, there's a lot of benefit if we can act as an aggregator um, and uh, do that on behalf of our, our users. I think the key thing for us is we want to do that where we see demand. So cloud, we'll be looking at anything really where we see a set of customers coming together and looking to bring that um, and, and move, them, move them as a group. So maybe we can stop five, 10 institutions doing uh, legal validation, commercial validation, all that kind of stuff. Uh, maybe we can, we can make that happen once, and once we've done it once, there's still 150 plus institutions out there who could make benefit out of the work that we do. So we're looking at sort of efficiency in a sort of wider scale. So we're looking at things like the um, procurement and all that kind of stuff. So um, there's a few examples here uh, of the sort of things that we want to do. Um, some of it's around due diligence. So the benefit of Janet is that we're not for profit, so not everything we're going to do is going to be about um, trying to be sustainable. Some of it's just going to be about doing the right things on behalf of our, of our customers. And uh, so one of the things we've talked about, email. We've got some great email products from Google, Microsoft, that they've given uh, education pricing, but not everyone is adopting them. And there is a huge amount of money that still could be saved within, within our area. Um, what can we do? So, we, we wrote a white paper because people didn't really know what the products were that were out there. They were evolving. Um, and what came out of that was actually, that's great. We understand the products. Uh, the commercial stuff, though, God, we don't know anything about that. Um, there's all sorts of bits of paper, and we don't know where the data resides, and we have all sorts of problems there. What can you do with that? So actually looking at um, further down, the standard commercial agreements, it's a good example of uh, we're working with 15 uh, institutions at the moment, so we're doing one set of uh, validation on the commercial agreements uh, around that so that we can, we can bring 15, 15 institutions to market um, and save them a whole chunk of money on an annual basis. Um, frameworks. So uh, working in, in our sector, government procurement is a factor. Um, we've seen that um, there is room for... Uh, some commercial vehicles, essentially, that are, that are required in order to get people to adopt. So uh, frameworks are part of that, government uh, procurement frameworks. Um, what we've done, 
in our attempt around infrastructure as a service is to put together a framework that combines data centers and infrastructure, reflecting specifically the needs of higher education where uh, a number of people are looking at outsourcing their data center requirements. Uh, they aren't necessarily looking to outsource their infrastructure, but they are in the future. So what can we do to provide something? Well, we've provided a framework um, and it's pre-packaged to meet a variety of requirements. So uh, data resides in the EU, uh, we've done standard contracts, um, we've got some really great suppliers to work with, including Dell. Um, and um, so we're hoping that by doing some of this stuff, we can reduce the time it takes people to get to market um, and to procure. We hope that we can reduce the amount of uh, validation that they want to do. And, um, reduce the amount of time they spend on procurement, which is, ex which is an expensive job in itself. So frameworks, we think, are very important. Um, and lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about cost. Um, so we're looking at some tools to understand cost. But I suppose I just my observation, because there's a few different uh, comments around it, I think, so I saw a presentation by someone from Berkeley talking about some work they're doing in America at the moment. And there's a thing called the Twitter Earthquake Detection Project, which I don't know if you've heard about. But um, the, the project's called TED. Um, it looks at Twitter data and works out uh, where earthquakes are. So it uses things like hash quake, uh, things are shaking, or whatever. It looks at certain keywords in Twitter and can accurately place an earthquake and the center of the earthquake, it can, it can do all that kind of stuff. Um, by using Twitter data, which I think is fascinating. The reason I mention it is because the only way you can do that is with something like cloud. Cloud service, where all this data is coming in, gives you an enabler that you can do something quite amazing. Now, we all have data in our own institutions, but, but I think there's a real um, potential for cloud services that offer an opportunity cost way beyond the current delivery that we've got. So we've got all this great data, but I think there's lots of amazing things that you could do with that data that aren't just the sort of hygiene thing that you're being asked to do today. Um, so I think we also need to be mindful of there's a, there's a fantastic opportunity cost, I think, coming down the road that we need to think about. So if other institutions are going in that direction, what are we going to miss out on um, if we don't do that? And I think you could look at the bottom line and we can look at ROI but I do think that maybe there's something around the opportunity cost of going to cloud that, that is something that you wouldn't really be able to do yourselves. Um, I also think that having worked in a local authority, the, uh, the other cost that I saw was you'd spend a long time arm twisting people to get something, get your project up on, uh, get, get your project going. Uh, once you've got that budget sign off, it then took three to six months and a further six a series of arm twisting of, uh, of your own staff and time and, and vendors and et cetera, et cetera, to actually get the thing up and running. Um, and I think that that three, six, 12 months, sometimes years, um, is also not to be scoffed at. I think that when you're looking at costing, you probably ought to be thinking about things like that. So um, I think that I just, my observation on cost and cloud was the opportunity both in terms of the speed you can get going and the opportunities that it's going to give you uh, are something that maybe aren't in your ROI, um, but maybe could be considered within that. And certainly that's something that we're, we're looking to try and do some work around. So overall, um, in the sort of slightly whistle-stop tour of higher education, the, um, I just wanted to finish on um, really the fact that the work we're doing, the idea behind it is actually not to deliver cloud services but to deliver some tangible things for students in universities. So we want to improve the student experience. Um, the students are spending lots of money these days. They deserve to get value for that money. Um, people need to be able to do things like distance learning, um, research. We've talked a bit about, there was a bit about um, HPC, but you can actually considerably shrink the time to do research by using some of these um, uh, cloud infrastructures, so the time to actually do a particular chunk of uh, calculation can be considerably reduced, depending on how you do that. Distributed com computer models have part to play. Um, and also in things like shared configuration, let's just 
try and find sort of some standards and build on them within the cloud so that we can, we can sort of drive best practice in a, in a framework and, and not keep doing the same things over and over individually. So um, that's me. That's, and I don't think there are questions, but I left my thing there. Thank you. <laughs>